Uh, next, I want to talk about success and failure in software and digital products. Uh, so those, th this is kind of where I'm going to contrast the project we see in the first section with uh, real world examples. Uh, projects that uh, you know uh, you know of, but also um, I'm going to look at uh, at least one example of physical good. Um, I'm also going to look at some uh, just broad industry data of what success and failure means for digital products. Um, here's where we're also seeing what kinds of questions you should be asking. And in the third section, I'm going to reframe the example in the first where I take us through a project. I'm going to tweak some of the variables of that same example um, and show the posture of how, uh, how that project is <coughs> in terms of delivering the product. Um, and though, again, this example will be fictional, it's going to draw on the real world stuff in section two. So that's what we're doing. So first, I want to talk about a project. This is where you can ask questions about timeline and cost reasonably. Um, and so in this example, you're going to be the protagonist, and I just want you to imagine that you've taken on a new job as a project manager, and you're just learning the ropes. Uh, you are working for a development company, um, construction development, not software development, and your boss stops you in the hall and says, I have a project for you. Allocated the funds, I want you to start right away. Uh, I'd like you to build a house. And this isn't surprising because that's what the company does, so you reach for your notepad and start asking questions. While you scribble down on feature requirements, the boss interrupts you. Says, no, no, no. Don't ask me about implementation details or what every feature needs to be. I know it needs a front door, so you should have a front door. But uh, <coughs> houses are complicated. Your team has all the expertise you need to deliver something valuable. Um, so just make the best house you can for the money. So you've got a high level mission. And the boss is right, you've got teams to consult. So you go and talk to them. And you pile a list of features. And the experts weigh in, you've got the makings of an amazing house. And since you want to plan for a delivery date, but the boss knows what to expect from the day. You go to your teams and take their estimates. And you compile that into a coordinated calendar. Now, take note, this project has the following characteristics. When we're building a house, you can do a thing like declare features of it. Right? Are there going to be technical challenges? Yes. Huge technical challenges sometimes, depending on the scale of the project. Uh, many different areas of expertise have to come together to the uh, There's going to be a huge gap between good and bad execution and construction. No question about that. Uh, what about timeline? Can you reasonably estimate a timeline in a construction project? Well, you can. Are there, are there going to be delays? Well, there might be. Uh, a shipment could be late or defective. Maybe. Uh, when you were planning the ceiling height, you didn't think about the ball pit slide. And now you got to redo that whole thing. Um, mistakes were made, right? But uh, upon the delivery date, what would be extremely weird is that you hand over to the boss a revised set of feature lists that look nothing like what you started with. Right? This would be strange, and the boss would be rightly confused. Because when the construction is underway, you are unlikely to uncover some deeper truth about the, the way humans build and understand their homes. Um, even allowing plenty of creativity, which there can be, uh, the, the feature set is not likely to be overall. Not in this way. Right? So a feature not found in project here is this ground up reinvention of the thing you're building. Right? So digital products are different than this. You know, the, the, a digital product is more like what it's to do in business with you. Like, what is that like? I like to take the example of, of Amazon here. Um, it's tempting to think of uh, Amazon as its web page, because that's what I'm doing business with. But uh, you can take the example of, of Amazon as a company that's maybe more built on its prowess of logistics and back-end efficiency. What it's like to do business with Amazon is to expect two-day delivery without even thinking about it, and it's reliable. Data. There's a lot of data that uh, There's a lot that goes into that, but um, this this digital product is back in that. And there's no point at which that product is done. When does it even make sense to ask about a deadline for that? Um, it is their business. Um, 
So software isn't the house. I know this slide doesn't really impact, but uh, <laughs> you know, I like to think of it in terms of um, kind of the, the startup mentality as well. Because I'm drawing the distinction here between the product and the product. You can characterize that with like the startup mentality, which has these two seemingly totally at odds behaviors um, being exhibited all at the same time. Um, you have confidence and optimism that we usually associate with risk taking. Uh, and then you've got this cautious, deliberate validation that we associate with insecurity. And the startups have to do both at the same time. Um, those that lack the first don't dream. And if you lack the second, you never change. Either way, you might die. Um, startups get, you know, get talked about a lot because death is on the line. But I think the same applies to a large company. And you can apply those principles on small and large projects uh, no matter what your, your environment. Um, so let's talk about some, some digital products that have lived and died. Uh, I want to get into section two here. Um, I'm going to start with uh, an example that you might know. Uh, if you do know, don't shout it out. Uh, this story gets told from time to time. But does anyone remember Bourbon? Okay, this is an <coughs> early um, nascent smartphone era app. Uh, you probably recognize them by the probably recognize Bourbon by its, uh, its relaunch name, um, Instagram. So this was, uh, Bourbon was Instagram's predecessor. Um, it had pretty humble beginnings, right? So this thing is an absolute pile of features. Uh, this was back in the days when people would use the word gamification in this case. Uh, it had achievements in there, I think. Uh, what? Um, Right, so this, this was a uh, Foursquare competitor, if you remember Foursquare. Uh, that's what that looked like. Now, this was based around finding, uh, finding local sort of hidden gems, uh, having a fix on your neighborhood goods, uh, meetups and events. Um, now, like the bourbon UI we just saw a second ago, Foursquare is a grab bag feature. It's really just a shotgun approach to develop and try everything and see what sticks. That makes sense for the market they were in. This is total uncharted territory, and I don't, I, you know, I don't scorn at this. Like that's what you would do if you're trying to discover something. Uh, so Foursquare had a bunch of features. This list is huge. A to-do list. I like that. This had a to-do list. That's um, it's funny because the little app development tutorials these days often are to-do lists. Uh, I don't think that was a feature. Um, you know, uh, many of these features found their way into other products. Right? So. The, the market evolved, but Bourbon was more the same. Uh, it had these bloated features, no clear direction, um, but it, users were in love with this kind of below the fold feature that allowed them to share pictures in real time. And we don't think of that feature as being like, revelatory right now, but it's easy to forget how painful that used to be. Um, just think back to the days where you had a digital camera and the means of uploading photos to anyone was your computer maybe at a desk somewhere, and they were separated by a USB cable. Uh, suddenly the smartphone comes along, and it's got Wi-Fi and a carrier connection, and you can take a picture and instantly share it. Uh, Bourbon was now on the ground floor of this. Uh, it was something that our users were in love with, um, and this did not escape their notice. Um, so in case you think maybe pivoting away from this pile of features was obvious. It was not. This was not obvious. And it took guts to just go all in on this feature uh, that the data showed before. But how do you execute on that? How do you build something from that and, and deliver? That, that wasn't clear even then. Um, I don't bring up Instagram in this context because it had hockey stick growth and it made a billion dollars. That growth is very impressive, but I'm not talking about it. Reason. I'm talking about it because any growth at all would have been improbable if its founders had treated Bourbon like this uh, sacred list of must-have features. If they hadn't been ready to just pivot it away, if they, if they need to treat this like the uncharted, uncharted territory that it is. Um, so do you think Bourbon and Instagram's founders were treating this like a project or a product? So I'm sure they felt pressure to get this to market. 
Um, do you think they're fixated on some deadline? Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe they're worried about costs, but this is where the cautious validation has done its job. And are they about to let it muffle their confident outcomes with latching on to this feature that's apparently ready for the users? Um, we know that Instagram is definitely an outlier in a lot of ways. Um, so I, I want to move away from them and talk maybe more about the typical digital uh, you know, What does the industry have to say? What kind of data is out there about success and failure? How does the average venture sort of unlike Instagram? Um, there's a research firm that uh, compiles some of this data. They're called the Spanish firm. Um, they also do consulting on the side, but they publish data about uh, just broad industry. Uh, about 5,000 projects a year, they say, and I'm going to be referencing their 2015 report, which goes from 2011 to 2015. Um, the reason I'm going to talk about this data specifically is because in 2015, this is where they made will change and how they measure success. But just know that the research we're going through is a compilation of success and failure, what those, how those projects were managed, um, and, and on a bunch of other axes. Um, so first, I'm going to just talk about how they measure success before 2015, and what they changed, and what, how they measure success after that. What they started with before 2015 was about three met metrics. The first was, is the project on time? the next on budget. Right? So those do make some sense. You do want to know those. But their, their third was also this thing they call on target. And they're measuring, in that case, does the end product contain most of the features from the initial estimation? Did you build the thing you set out to build when you start? Now that's an interesting uh, way to measure success, especially in light of what we just talked about with Instagram. They might have classified Instagram as a failure, or at least perfect, because they didn't have a clear end goal, and they didn't deliver the thing they said they were going to deliver, but then they sold for a billion dollars for Facebook, so I, I don't know, is that success? Um, they changed this in 2015 to now talk about what they call a satisfactory result. This is, uh, in their words, um, you know, did it deliver the customer and user satisfaction regardless of the original scope? This is a beautiful pivot away from a deadline and towards utility. Is the thing actually useful? Isn't that what you want to know? I, I love this. Um, but right, so we're, let's get into some of their data. But uh, this is just an acknowledgment that deadlines don't supersede something on the muscle. Um, so what are the averages of this? Um, what we're looking at here is a chart uh, that shows successful, challenged, and failed projects over time uh, as a percentage. All projects that year. So in the successful category, we have those projects that meet all three of the criteria. They're on time, on budget, and have satisfactory results. These challenged ones are the ones that are missing one or more of those three. And the failed ones were scrapped altogether. Um, so we're not seeing anything amazing here uh, in terms of data, but 71% is a high rate of dissatisfaction in that middle challenge column in 2015. So the challenge plus fail uh, there is 71%. That's a lot of dissatisfaction. Uh, what does the Spanish group say about the determinants for the state? What's the biggest factor that leads to challenge plus fail? And they say it's project size. And what we're seeing here should also make sense. We see at the top grand scale projects, absolutely enormous, huge teams, huge goals. Um, it should make sense that that's difficult to execute on. Grand scale projects just presume to know the unknowable. They will drown in an ocean of minutia. Uh, any little thing goes wrong, they throw it off. You know, even, even if they get all the details right, they assume to know what the maximal utility is of the end product. And even on a small project like Urban, uh, it wasn't clear what was going to stick they had to pivot towards what was promising. Right? So these grand scale projects are very unlikely to do that. So that should make some kind of sense. Um, as they say, it's, uh, one of our major services to, is to break up large software projects into multiple small projects. So this is getting them further down this chart. 
uh, that we just discussed. Like I said, they used to consolidate, so they use their data to sell their services. Right? So that's what they say they do. Um, they continue, we found most software products only require a small team for a short duration in order to deliver value to an organization. Only in very rare cases do projects need to be larger and longer. Most, if not all, large, complex, multi-year projects are unnecessary. So prefer small projects when necessary. That sounds good. Um, they go on to talk about goals. And this is the last one I'll talk about for Spanish. But I find this one really fascinating. They made another reversal here in the way they measure things, uh, or in the way they interpret their own data. Um, the satisfactory results we saw from before was their way to pivot away from deciding if a project was a success based on your initial, uh, what you set out to do. And instead, is the thing just useful? Is it good? That's what, that's, they're pivoting more towards that data. And as they did that, the way their, their historical data in, in their database was measured in terms of success and failure changed the way they look at what they recommend your goals be. So um, what they started with was they recommend, that, and this is before their reframing, they recommended that an organization have all of their stakeholders aligned around known goals and pursue those. Now that sounds reasonable. They've stopped recommending doing that in light of this new information. Before the emphasis was on clarity, have your have clarity in your organization of what you're doing, where you're moving. Um, but after, the emphasis is on change. Now this matches the new satisfactory result. Right? So they they say no more should you focus on having clarity up front. You should be ready to pivot away from things as soon as you uh, have some promising new uh, possibility. Um, there's a lot more to the standards report. Uh, there's just, actually just one more thing I want to comment on that's uh, not too surprising. Um, they talk about the talent of the team involved. Uh, I, I don't know how they measure talent. I think it's really difficult to pin down. But uh, as they stated, Teams with higher talent are better at delivering those three measures of success. I, I can't be too surprised about that. So the, the takeaway message from, from these reports seemed to be use a small, talented team on a small project or break down a larger one uh, and give that team freedom to pivot. Okay, so just as a thought experiment, what would a huge project with a gigantic team and no flexibility look like? Have you seen any of those projects before? Um, I don't have to comment on <laughs> policy or get into anything about politics. I have a very constructive discussion about the history of this particular digital project. Now, every variable we just described is aligned against the succeeding. Um, we got a nationwide release on day zero. The, the timeline is absolutely rigid. They want this to happen, all right, it's got to be timed with policy. And for good reason, um, it was laden with oversight because you kind of want your public projects to have some, have some oversight. Um, that reduces the kind of flexibility we were just talking about, being able to pivot towards new opportunities. Um, because of the size of this project and the number of unknowns, uh, you know, even if you have your wits about you, you know, there's just no way to tackle this in three years. Um, maybe just as a take-home lesson from healthcare.gov for all of us in the room, it, it just never let it be said that your project is rigid as inflexible as a government project. Just never let it go that far. Um, uh, cut things down to scale. Use smaller goals, smaller teams. We can do that. The uh, government might not necessarily have that possibility. Um, you know, Megan McArdle wrote uh, an article in Bloomberg uh, or, uh, in 2015 uh, stating you know, the system had to be built in three years or more, but it could not be built the way Silicon Valley would do it. Start small, roll something out, see what works and what doesn't, then iterate, experiment, and scale until you finally arrive at something more to do. No, this site had to work on days day one in every state in the nation that declined to build the science um, 
she's the author of the most side of down. If you guys have seen that book, uh, subtitled Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. Um, you know, I think here that the ideas are simple. Healthcare.gov has a very simple idea and, and a nice one. Make this thing complicated, become simple for me. Uh, healthcare is really complicated. Who likes shopping for um, Execution on ideas is very difficult. This is another reason that when you know, a, a relative comes to me and says, I have an app idea, you're going to love it. But you can't tell anybody. I say, tell everybody, who cares? Uh, execution is the thing you know, that, that's difficult. Uh, I'll get to one more whimsical example right now of a failed product. This is my favorite in recent years. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen Juicero. Uh, if you did miss this one, uh, this is a juicer, a $400 juicer, uh, with a writer. Uh, you got to purchase a subscription to the juice packs. Um, very good TV. Look, and mind you, that $400 price tag for the juicer was reduced from $700 in this investor panic. Um, but this is, to me, an example of supreme confidence and confidence in that uh, startup mindset. Right? And I like this example because it just uses with this. And it's got this absolute lack of cautious validation. Um, I, that's what it looks like from an outsider. I wasn't there. I don't know how it went down. Uh, but with $118 million in VC fund, I might start to get a bit confident, too. And you know, uh, maybe there is, and I'll entertain the idea, maybe there absolutely is some market for a boutique juicer with DRM and juice packages. But you know, I don't know. I didn't explore that space. But it seems that they didn't either, because you could just squeeze it out with your hands, and it worked fine. And that's where the whole thing imploded. Um, they were mocked endlessly for this. Uh, but I'm going to say, look, I think the failure was validation. That's just what it looks like to me. Just check. Okay, are you doing the right thing? And you need to go to your users and ask them. Um, so uh, I'm moving along a good clip. I'm on the third section here, but uh, what we've seen is some examples of building digital products with success and failure, and uh, how like the sort of risk management tactics you use on a project, like building a home, don't work in the examples of digital products. Um, so for this last section, uh, I just, like I said, I want to reframe that construction project in the first section as a digital product. I'm going to change some of the variables, um, and we're going to see those bad questions and how they can turn into good ones. Um, so again, imagine this time you've taken a new job. Uh, you're a project manager at a vendor of computer parts, okay? And you're just learning the ropes. And again, the boss stops you in the hall. I allocated some funds. I'd like you to start as soon as possible. I need you to build our website. Okay, this is not surprising again to you because you sell computer parts and your customers would like to place their orders on them. So you reach for your notepad again. You want some feature requirements, but the boss stops you and says, no, don't ask me for a list of features or to give implementation details. Software's complicated and your team has all the expertise they need. Uh, just work within the budget and get us the best website you can. And right, so, crap. Not gonna work. Um, uh, but since you know the history of Instagram, you know you can't declare all the features up front. It wouldn't make sense to write this list down. So you're not going to start doing that. But what you are going to do is make some educated guesses <coughs> using the data you have uh, and be ready to pivot the best information at the time. So you analyze your market competition, uh, you write down some things you think might benefit the website and the business. Um, with your company's good reputation as customer service, I think maybe uh, chat online would emphasize that advantage. And you think maybe customers would like to discover new products in your catalog if they come out, hence some product suggestions. And maybe you know that this is an enthusiast market of buyers that like to plan their purchases in depth and sort of geek out about it, so a wish list makes sense. Uh, but now what? What do you do? Should you go around to all your team and 
and ask them for their estimates and how long it would take to support those features in their entirety and then plan some distant date for completion. Are you going to do that? Right? Uh, these are sensible guesses, but they have to prove their value. So instead of a deadline, uh, you're going to be asking, how soon can I know more? And infusions of new information should come on a scale of days, not weeks or months. So if you could, and even if you could set out to build this, this first draft feature, while you ignore new information as it comes in, I mean, just ask Juicero how that worked out. Uh, that's not the path you want to follow. Uh, the more you try to manage that risk by locking in all the details, the sooner you will drown in those unknowns. You have to be ready to contend with those. And if you lose the flexibility to do that, you've failed before you start. It doesn't stop there. There is another crushing cause to asking your team those questions. Much, much worse. Suppose um, in the process of this, your engineers discover a hitch. They can't deliver on one of the core features without overhauling this old legacy system. So whatever project deadline you plan on is toast. There is no way you're going to make it. So given that your leaders at your deadline fixated organization are overcome uh, you know, with, that, with, with deadlines, you've got a really tough choice to make. Are you going to release an unfinished or useless product anyway, but guarantee that your uh, leaders will pat you on the head to give you a bonus? Or are you going to risk your job and wait until the product is useful and release it then? It actually gets worse. A similar scenario. But suppose, once again, uh, this is a legacy system that needs an overhaul. Uh, but undeterred, you get to work. You jump in. However, your engineers don't particularly find this task fun. And they know that your organization is fixated on deadlines. Do you think they could use that as a lever against you or your leadership? I got one more. I want you to tell me if this one sounds good. How many times have you seen a team at a large organization completely reject the idea of working with another team at the same organization, claiming that it would push out their deadlines or jeopardize the work? Even though what the product vision demands is that both teams work together for a holistic solution. This, this right here is deadline fixation coming from every side, mostly from the top. <coughs> it puts those teams in a pinch. Um, a team in that situation is most likely being pressured from stakeholders with effective questions. Questions like, how much is it going to cost? Which has embedded in it the assumption that digital products are built once and completed like a house. And questions like, how much is going to be, uh, you know, when's it going to be done? That also carries the assumption that you have all of these insights up front. You've declared your feature list, and you, you can now plan what the release date's going to be. Before you've done any of the hard work of discovery and validation. And when you lock in those assumptions, uh, you prevent adaptation to changing market conditions. Um, and you are virtually guaranteeing missed opportunities for 